Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to foretell with sibylline accuracy the death of the period instrument movement. Yes, folks, the party is over. It's done with. I've come to this conclusion based actually on some of my interactions with you folks and some recordings I've heard recently and reviewed recently or may review in the future. And and this is this is where we are. Let's take stock of what's been happening and then see what it means or what the potential implications of it are. Remember when we did that that little little critical listening test where I played three different versions of the opening of Beethoven's Fifth, one of which was an older one, which did quite well, and I asked you to rank them, one of which was a new one uh, with a modern orchestra, and one of which was a periodish one on Naxos with Adam Fisher. Now, it seems to me that the Adam Fisher probably, very slightly, was the most popular of all of them. And the Adam Fisher was the most periody, instrumenty performance of it. That tells me that people have come to simply expect that kind of approach to that kind of music. Whether I agree with it or disagree with it is irrelevant. What matters is simply what the numbers were. Now, of course, this is one example, and it was not a statistically reliable sampling and all of those things. But I was quite surprised because for me, that was it far and away the least interesting performance. But I have to I have to go with what with what you told me. And you seem to really like it for a bunch of reasons. Never mind that the reasons stated were actually not what was happening in the performance quite often. Um, you know, demonstrably and audibly. Again, you know, what people hear and what they say are often two different things also. But it was a very, very interesting exercise. And as a result of that, it seems that uh, that's the way the world is going. And also, the one that you liked the least was a very similar performance. It was that Robert Trevino performance on Ondine with the Malmo Symphony Orchestra, with a regular orchestra, but played in period style. It seems that um, when you do period style um, next to a, a more let's say authentic, oh, I hate that word, a more, a more obviously periody period style, if I told you what it was, um, it was the regular performance that got dissed the most. Uh, some of you said that this was because I had indicated who the performers were and sort of gave away the game, and that may be true. That may have created a certain prejudice, prejudicial attitude in some people's minds. But here's the thing. The thing is that there was really very little difference between those performances, very little, and and the descriptions of them were rather exaggerated in trying to you know highlight what the differences were. But Trevino's version is what we tend to hear today. It's the kind of performance we're likely to hear. And the same is true of period instrument ensembles. I was just listening to the, the Jordi Saval Beethoven cycle, which I have not reviewed. But um, I may at some point if I feel like it. But the thing that really struck me about it was that there's absolutely nothing special to it. Nothing. Zero. Zip. It's a cookie cutter period instrument performance. And we are encountering more and more cookie cutter period instrument performances of that type between Saval and Fisher and Trevino and just about anything else that you're going to hear today by an up-to-date interpreter Um, it's going to sound pretty much the same. Now, this was also true, let's not kid ourselves, of the paradigm before the period instrument movement got going. When you had regular modern orchestras playing regular modern performances, there was a style, there was a tradition, and 99% of the performances sounded like that tradition. And they were indistinguishable one from the next, other than teeny tiny little interpretive differences. There is, however, one distinction that's worth making, which is that the Romantic approach admitted a vastly wider range of options for interpretation than the period instrument approach does. Remember, the the original modern, I mean, the traditional approach allowed you to try to play at Beethoven's metronome marks. Some people did. 
Some people didn't. Some people had more fidelity to what they called the score than others. So there was, I mean, the difference between a Toscanini performance and a Fort Wengler performance is vastly different, vastly greater, pardon me, than the difference between any two period instrument performances between Saval and Hogwood and Gardner and whoever you want to, whoever you want to claim. Because the differences are less going to be questions of tempo or of timbre or of accent and and there's simply going to be difference between the differences between one group and the next with everyone doing more or less the similar thing so uh, these cookie cutter performances as i call them have become the modern paradigm and when that happens the argument's over i mean the victory of the period instrument instrument movement is going to sow the seeds of its destruction when everyone's doing it, they're no longer different. And the reason that they existed in the first place was to be different. Not only are they no longer different, but modern orchestras, normal modern orchestras, have always been extraordinarily adaptable. I mean, to all kinds of different styles of music. The idea that the modern orchestral sound is a monolith when it comes to like vibrato or, or anything else, timpani sound or brass or you, you name it, is such hooey. It has always been hooey. Let me, let me give you an example of that, and I'll explain exactly what I mean. In, in 1965, Leonard Bernstein did a talk, a young person's concert talk, on the sound of the orchestra. The entire purpose of that talk was to describe how orchestras must adapt themselves to the different sounds that the composer requires. And because I have been obsessing for God knows how many years now over string tone and the vibrato issue and the incorrectness of string tone in the period instrument movement, um, I, I want to read something from the script of that particular, that particular talk on the sound of the orchestra where he talks about vibrato. It's a fascinating little paragraph. And here it is. I cited it in one of my, my papers that was published in Music and Letters on the sound of the, on the, sound of the orchestra. Zo Klinkt Wien, it was called. Conductor's Vibrato and Expressive String Timbre, or something like that. Here is what Bernstein wrote. He wrote, you see, there are all kinds of ways to make vibrato, and they're all very expressive of something. But the question is, which one is expressive of Haydn? He's talking about playing Haydn correctly. All right, let's test it. Mr. Monroe, he's talking to the principal cellist, would you play us the vibrato you used when you played that first phrase from Haydn's Symphony No. 88, the Largo Second Movement? And then he says to the children, presumably the children, do you approve of that? And the cello shakes his head, no. And Bernstein says, no, of course. It's too sentimental. It's like those singers who drive you crazy with the tremolo in their voices. Then he sings it. Like that. He sings it. He says, it's an unbearable sound. All right, Mr. Monroe, let's hear the phrase with what you consider the proper vibrato. Then he plays it again. He writes, that's more like it. A small, rapid vibrato. Very elegant indeed. And now that we know so much about vibrato, let's listen to the same string phrase again in all its sentimental wrongness, using the big, slow, wide vibrato, which would be great for music written 100 years later, but not for Haydn. Okay, then they, they go on like that. So my point is this. The period instrument movement has been claiming for a bazillion years that they are fighting against, I mean, listen to, you know, someone like Roger Norrington, constant vibrato, continuous, monotonous, timbrely uniform vibrato. Nobody's ever done that. No one's ever played that way. Every performer worth their salt has always created a sound appropriate to the music that they were playing, whatever they thought that was. So, so the premise on which people like Roger Norrington and the, the period instrument people based their theories was wrong to begin with, and they knew it. 
if they were decently trained musicians from anywhere, they knew it. That's why the whole thing was kind of a, a fraud, a, a, a selling you a bill of goods about what they were doing. What, what really happened was just the opposite. By taking vibrato out, by saying, this is the way the timbre has to be, they were the ones who are creating a gray pall of oppressive timbral monotony over everything that they play. Who wants to hear Haydn played the same way as Brahms? But that's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly how the period instrument people would have us believe orchestras really sounded. And it's, it's an appalling lie and an easily demonstrable lie. I mean, you just look at, there's the evidence right there. And there's lots more, lots more. I mean, we don't have to go into it. But the point is not that they're right or that they're wrong. The point is that musicians, who often are not the brightest bulbs in the intellectual chandelier, will do whatever they're told to do if they believe that this is what the scholarship says. And the scholarship, no matter how bad it is, I mean, they're busy people. They don't have time to go and, and look and see if primary sources are being used correctly, if the research has been done, has been done appropriately, if there's the logic behind the argument makes any sense. And they don't care. They just say, ah, some, some scholar person who claims to be an authority says, this is what we need to do. So this is what we're going to do. And that is exactly what has happened. And one of the saddest examples to me, actually, was the recent work of Herbert Blomstedt, who I've been talking about. You know, he recently did a Beethoven cycle. And in that Beethoven cycle, he said he went back to using Beethoven's metronome markings. Happily, he didn't always. He's a great enough musician to know when they don't make any sense and to ignore them um, and to base his tempi more on the acoustic of the room and the number of players and what the music seems to require, which is, of course, what we should be doing, not paying attention to metronome markings other than as very rough guides to relative proportions. So, so you know, we see people and he was 90 something. And then he just came out with Schubert's Eighth and Ninth, which I reviewed here, which obviously show the influence of the period instrument movement in their somewhat mechanical approach to tempo in the attempt at great transparency of texture in the smallness of the sound. And remember, he's doing this with the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra. And the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra is one of the great orchestras in the world, of the world today. They're, they're marvelous, right? They can play anything. And that's why the period instrument movement is doomed, because orchestras have always, since Leonard Bernstein tells us, been prepared to be flexible to adopt whatever timbral requirements the music demands. But it's not just that they can, that they're chameleons, that they can take on whatever colors they want. We've heard that also with Nicholas Harnoncourt, with his performances with modern orchestras and modern instruments, primarily of classical period stuff. And of Roger Norrington in Stuttgart, creating the Stuttgart sound. He would have you believe that that's a new thing, that it's because of him that the Stuttgart sound existed. It's total nonsense. When Stuttgart played with Celebadaki, they had the Celebadaki sound, and it was just as different. Anyone can do it. Orchestras always have done it. But now there is a new paradigm which they've all adopted, and that new paradigm has been, and I'm not saying it's a negative thing entirely. It has its good parts and bad parts. I mean, it's negative when the performance is boring. You know, when it's an unimaginative, rote performance that, it can, that expresses nothing but the paradigm and not the uniqueness of the interpretation of the music, because you can't get away from that, can you? It's thrilling when the interpreters really pull it together and they deliver a thrilling interpretation. And it's thrilling not because it follows the paradigm, it's thrilling to the extent that it differs from the paradigm, that it makes something special out of that particular event, that work, that performance. But the paradigm has been adopted. 
It's like the theory of relativity. It was adopted gradually. The scientific community came around to believing in Einstein, to believing in the Big Bang, enough evidence accumulated. Well, there's no evidence here. It's just a question of, 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 of practice and, and I think a lot of intellectual laziness. But again, you know, what I think about it, even though I keep going back to it, doesn't really matter. What matters is what they're doing. So if Blumstedt, who is 95, is, is, is doing this stuff, and Bernard Heitink was doing it in his Beethoven recordings in London, then by in winning, in winning the argument, the period instrument movement has lost. And the reason they've lost most of all is because the world's big orchestras, the major orchestras, the regularly constituted orchestras, quite simply, have the best players, they have the best instruments, they have the most talent. They're the most substantially funded and regularly constituted groups out there. They aren't pickup ensembles, as are so many period instrument groups. They are, they are major ensembles that have been playing together for decades. They have the corporate sonority. They have all of the things that will deliver superior rote performances. I mean, there will always be the, you know, rare, fabulous performances, but day in, day out, they're just going to do a better job. And so what's going to happen, what I predict, what I see happening, and I hear this too, is that the period instrument ensembles are going to be doing wackier and wackier things to try and maintain their, their illusion of difference. You're going to see groups like the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra or Saval and these people doing repertoire they have no business doing, none whatsoever, and applying absolutely absurd, ludicrous, extreme versions of the period instrument paradigm to make that music sound as, as different as they possibly can from what the normal orchestras are doing, adopting much of the same, same practices. And some of the practices are wonderful. Listen. There is no reason why we had to live forever with soggy, slow tempos in classical period music, with trumpets and drums that you could never really hear, that were always sort of you know, out in the back somewhere. I mean, with strings that were, that were excessive in their use of vibrato. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. I mean, all of these things are good things if they're you know, appropriate to the music that's being played. So I'm not complaining about that. But what I am saying is that these people are no longer unique. Their specialness is gone. The success has been co-opted by regular ensembles. And that's just the way the world works. That's a normal, normal state of affairs. And it's, it's a good thing, basically. It means that our sense of, of, of the repertoire is not static, that it's always changing, that our tastes are changing, that things are different from what they used to be. I do think we should not lose our ability to appreciate or even love what used to be because you know greatness is as greatness sounds. We should be able to enjoy a, a fabulous performance in whatever style the performers happen to adopt. And it really doesn't matter what style they happen to adopt if the performance is going to be fabulous. It really doesn't. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, we, we should not dismiss a performance on the basis simply of the fact that it's, it's what we now consider to be anachronistic. I mean, there's nothing more anachronistic than Beecham's Messiah, right? With its modern orchestration and complete rewriting of everything. And it's fabulous. It's just a wonderful performance of the Messiah. It's wrong in all kinds of ways. And we're not even talking about that degree of wrongness because no musician other than Beecham and Stokowski and the real, the real, you know, romantic, romantic genius conductors who could do whatever they damn well pleased um, would, would attack a piece of music the way they did. The romantic crazies today, and I don't think they're geniuses at all, are the period instrument people. Again, it's a function of the modern conductor genius psychosis, which romantic conductors have, because the one thing, as I've said before, that period instrument groups never had was a conductor.
They never had a modern conductor. They never had one guy at the head of the crew saying, you're going to do this this way. You're going to do this that way. They had a concert master or they had a conductor who essentially beat time. And all the players did what they were going to do. And so it was not a question of having one of these these, these megalomaniacal period instrument people ruling over their tiny little turf, their pint-sized players, or the Theodore Carensis whack jobs who are trying to, you know, reclaim that megal megalomaniacal pedestal of, 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 you know, directorial excess. That's what the period instrument movement is doing, and it's just the same stuff manifesting itself in a different way a slightly different way, really a slightly different way to be quite honest with you. So that, for the, in essence, to summarize the whole thing, the period instrument movement has won. They have changed the paradigm of what a lot of the standard repertoire should sound like in performance. And in changing that paradigm, they have rendered themselves ubiquitous. And they have furthermore created an entirely new pile of cookie cutter, uninteresting performances against which there will be a reaction at some point. Mark my words, it's coming, whether it comes in our lifetime or not, who knows, but it's coming. Because when everybody starts doing the same thing, you're going to find a bunch of people who want to do something different. So I, it's a fascinating thing, right, from my perspective anyway, and uh, I'd be curious to get yours. That's sort of how I see it at the moment. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.